this year and with a message along those lines. And so I want you to give a great big welcome to Pastor Doug as he comes today. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Praise the Lord. It's an honor to be with you this morning. This uh, is a different context for me from when I started in ministry, and the first church I pastored was First Church in Flagler Beach, Florida. And uh, I like this place better, thank you. I want to talk to you this morning about prayer, as, as uh, Pastor mentioned, and, and before I get there, I want to uh, do a couple of preliminary things. Um, I'm tugged in a couple of, of directions this morning because uh, this past week, um, uh, the head of a family, that, uh, Dr. Thomas Leon Wells, who means a lot to me and his children and, and their spouses, who I all grew up with since I was this high, uh, he died. And typically, I would be there, and right now, as we're meeting, uh, his funeral is going on. And it's kind of hard to ask you to pray for people you've never known or seen, but you'll see him one day, and uh, maybe 100 years from now, maybe um, before then. But if you would just allow me to settle my heart down, and then you just join me and join your faith with mine for, for what's going on in Daytona Beach today, where I grew up. Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, I thank you uh, for the life of, of Dr. Wells. And Lord, uh, as his family uh, gathers around that funeral home today, I ask for the comfort, the compassion, and the literal presence of the Savior, Jesus Christ, to blanket every person in that meeting. I pray for the children, Tom Wells Jr., John, Bill, Rick, Bobby, and Susan, my friends, my whole life, and some of the other brothers and sister, Stephen, David, and Ashley, and I pray for Brenda. And so, Lord, just uh, engulf them with your presence and power. And I can rest in this sermon time knowing that you have that in your hand. Every heart that's there, every heart that's broken is mended in Jesus Christ. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for doing that with me. I, um, years ago, was... Uh, at a meeting, and one of the preachers in the meeting was Dr. Tony Evans, who pastors a large church in uh, Dallas, Texas. You probably, some of you recognize that name. And I'll never forget that Dr. Tony Evans said, we have no native luminescence. I thought that was pretty good. I've never forgotten. I pray it all the time. And every time I get ready to get up in a pulpit, Say, Lord, Lord, I have no native luminescence today. Everything I have is derived from you. As we would go to the word of God, as we would seek your truth, God, by your spirit, transform us. By your light, enlighten us and bring us to a new place in you. For it is to your glory and to the glory of your son, Jesus Christ, and the advance of his kingdom that we join our faith and believe you for these things gathered in your name today. Amen. Amen. We're starting for real now. And I want to start with a story. And the story is this. It seems that there was this kingdom, and not far from the king's castle, there was a humble farmer, and he was toiling a small plot of land. And this farmer, by the way, so loved his king, and one day the farmer came upon the most beautiful carrot he had ever seen. It was perfect in every way. And the farmer was just overwhelmed by the beauty of this carrot, I guess as only a farmer could be. But he goes to the castle, and he asks to see the king, and after waiting and waiting and waiting, finally someone comes out and says, 
Okay, you may have an audience with the king and he walks in and goes through the corridors and enters this great hall where there's a three-second echo with every step he takes and there's the king on his throne and the farmer approached him and he says, Oh, wonderful king, I wanted you to have this most beautiful carrot. And the king takes the carrot and then the king judges the farmer's heart. And the king says this, Oh, faithful servant, Thank you for this beautiful carrot. Please receive nine times the land you have and 20 workers to work that land for you. And the farmer left, loving his king and rejoicing in his love for his king. Now as all of this happened, there was a guy standing off to the side He might have been an official in the court, but he saw all this. And he thinks to himself, man, if you can get that for a carrot, just think what I can get for a horse. So this guy, he goes out and he starts searching the kingdom and far and wide, and he finds the most magnificent horse you've ever seen. It was an expensive horse, and this guy sacrifices, and he sells everything to buy this horse and he goes back and he presents himself to the king and he says oh wonderful king I wanted you to have this most beautiful horse the king again judges his heart takes the horse turns around and starts walking away well this guy is standing there flabbergasted thinking wait a minute, that's it? And knowing the guy's thoughts, the king turns and says, the farmer gave me the carrot. You gave yourself the horse. And the point of this story is, don't find God useful. Don't find God useful. Find God beautiful. Don't find prayer useful. Find prayer, wings on which to soar in the presence of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit of God and have access to God the Father. Find prayer as a door to walk in and sense the magnificence, the miracle-working magnificence and beauty and splendor of the one who hung the universe in the heavens and by his very thought keeps everything running and taking care of itself in, in perfect order. Find prayer as an intimate access to Jesus Christ to regard his beauty, to regard his Alpha and Omega, to regard that which will cause a sky so full of so many legions of angels it'll cover every space when he returns and all they'll do is fall down and say, holy, holy, holy is he, the Alpha and the Omega. Find prayer beautiful, not useful. And as you approach this prayer summit on Friday, it will make all the difference in the world for you. And today I'd like to discuss some things I'd like to do with you to prepare your hearts to engage, to encounter, to to come into contact with the beauty of a risen Savior who loved you so much that he died rather than live without you. And all the useful stuff, that'll take care of itself. Because I read somewhere, I read somewhere, seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and these things shall be added to you. Early in my life, I had a grandmother, and we used to call her, I had Good grief, I don't know how many cousins I have, but we used to call her the Baptist nun. And she loved Jesus, and she let everybody know about it, and we'd get out in restaurants, and we'd say, Nana, would you pray for the meal? And she'd pray her little prayer. 
And then she'd go up about 70 decibels. And Lord, if there's anyone here that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior and Lord. And there we were in Avon Park, Florida, trying to slide under the table. But she did it every time. And one of the things that my grandmother taught me as a child that she wrote about me when I was in, wrote to me when I was in the military was the truth that God answers prayer. And I can remember the impact that that had on me and it still has on me that God answers prayer because I had to engage with my head, the one who made the universe, the God of all eternity. You mean he can actually hear me? He can actually, I can actually have influence in his court and he'll hear me I can pray and he'll answer me and God said call upon me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you know not and Jesus said ask and you shall receive and James says you have not because you ask not and so on this January day where it was around minus 17 when I walked in I want to offer you this morning, not me personally, but I want to represent a truth to you that is more valuable in this hour to you than two plane tickets this afternoon to Waikiki. And that is the truth that as we gather together as God's people on Friday, there are some expectations that exceed what most of us have even thought about that we can walk into. And that we shouldn't let this moment and this hour and these day and a half pass by us if we can be involved and if we can be in there because it'll mean so much to us and there's so much at stake. And Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. And James says, you have not because you ask not. And I'm like, man, I don't have a failure in my life, a need in my life, a beauty in my life that isn't connected to prayer. And so I'm going to quickly survey some things with you that when we come together on Friday, not only are we going to pray individually, we're going to pray corporately because when the church gathers together to pray corporately, if you look at the Word of God, isn't it true that the mighty moves of God uh, follow those meetings? Mm Mm-hmm. We're going to pray in Jesus' name, and we're going to see what that means. We're going to pray in His will. We're going to pray in the Holy Spirit. We're going to pray in obedience to Jesus, and we're going to pray in fellowship with the saints. And finally, we're going to pray in faith, believing God. Because it was prayer that Moses stopped the hail of Exodus 9 with. King Hezekiah was in prayer and they were delivered as a result of that prayer. The angel of the Lord came and prayed uh, or killed 186,000 enemies of the southern kingdom in 2 Chronicles 32. In Psalm 66, we learn that it is in prayer that God hears our voice. And in prayer, the angel came to Daniel and in chapter 9, verse 23, it says, as soon as you began to pray, an answer was given. You think that's always true? Which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Jesus, Matthew 21, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Mark 11, Jesus puts it this way, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Prayer is awesome and it is sustained by God's people in Acts 1 14 they all joined together and were constantly in prayer when they heard this they raised their voices together in prayer to God and as they prayed the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the Word of God boldly Paul said I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer without anger or disputing and I want to say that being in prayer this weekend is so powerful because prayer can do anything God can do and God can do anything think about that 
Being in prayer is so powerful because through prayer, we can have anything we want if we'll want what God wants. But if we knew everything God knows, we knows, we would want exactly what He wants. What an opportunity! And we're going to gather as His church. And we're not going to see this as a meeting that we have to force ourselves to go to out of duty. We're going to see this as a meeting that we get to flock to because of the beauty of God Almighty and His Son, Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's different than we've ever thought about it. As a pastor, years ago in my 30s, I started going to prayer summits, and about 42 of us pastors from different denominations, we'd gather together um, in this place in Alabama, and we'd be there from Monday to Friday. And the first time, about three or four years into this, because these prayer summits were by far my best week of the year, every year, I started requiring my staff to go. And I want you to know, my minister of education's heel marks ran from Huntsville, Alabama to Birmingham. Because I had to drag him there. And it was true. For the minister of, yeah, the minister of youth, he was a little more open to it. But we have these terrible conceptions that maybe the devil's planning in there that, oh my gosh, how do you pray for five days, let alone an hour? Church, God shows up. And the beauty of His magnificence is there waiting for us. And we enter in. And sometimes it takes a little time, but He shows up. Well, He's already there. We become aware that He's already there. And God begins to do things beyond anything we could ever imagine. Prayer brings God into action. And I don't have a failure in my life, but somehow it wasn't a prayer failure. But being in prayer is the most wonderful because that's how I abide in Jesus. There's no need in my life, but what if I learned how to pray and knew how to pray that that need would be met? I want to talk to you about how to have a lifestyle. I want you to begin to live out that lifestyle well before Friday or Friday's fine too. But according to the scripture, God is going to hear your prayer. And when God hears your prayer, your life is going to be infused with blessings. If you were to take your Bible, but I'll go there for you because I wrote it out already. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to me except by the Father. Uh, un- no one comes unto the Father, but it- by me. Now, of course, he's talking about salvation, but here's an enormous spiritual principle. When we come to God in prayer, we're coming to the Father, and the only way we can come to the Father in prayer is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 13, he says, And whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. You reckon that's true? Amen or oh me? If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. If you go to verse 23, Jesus said, And in that day you'll ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatever you ask, You shall ask of the Father in my name, and he'll give it to you. You reckon that's true? I grew up in the South. Sorry about the reckons. But up until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask what you have, and you shall receive that your joy may be full. So the first key to answered prayer to entering into his miracle-working magnificence, to entering into his beauty, is to ask in Jesus' name. Clearly, plainly, it is the Father we need to reach in prayer, and the only way we can come to the Father is through the what, class? The Son. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus Christ brings us to the Father. What a trip. A wonderful verse that you might put if you're taking notes is Ephesians 2.18. It speaks of the Lord Jesus, and it says, For through Him... We, have both, we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. And that tells us what prayer is about. Through Jesus, we have access by the Spirit to the Father. By the Spirit, through Jesus, by the Father. So to pray in Jesus' name is not a little phrase that we just tack on to the end of the prayer. To pray in Jesus' name is to invoke resurrection power that is 
We have no native luminescence because of our standing in Christ. God listens, and things in heaven and happens, and we see the effects of those things in our lives, and our joy becomes greater and fuller. It's amazing what takes. And the very first key to answered prayer is that you must learn to pray in the name of Jesus. And you must have Christ in your heart as your Lord and your Savior. And as you pray in his name, gaze upon him. Find him beautiful. Find him magnificent. Find him breathtaking. Find him as the beginning and the middle and end of all things. To him be glory and honor. And find him in a way that he just melts your heart. And you'll pray out of relationship. And you'll pray out of beauty. And you won't pray out of utility. You won't pray out of duty. You won't pray out of what's in this thing for me. But the second thing, and they get quicker and quicker, so don't start calibrating. Oh, I'm going to be here until one. No, you won't be here until one. You must pray in the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Here the Apostle Paul is giving us a marvelous lesson on prayer. And he says, praying always in the prayer, uh, praying always with all prayer and supplication. Three words, in the Spirit. So, first principle, we pray in the name of Jesus, and now we pray in the Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit is called, in the Bible, the Spirit of prayer. Zechariah 12.10, if you've not been there, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of grace and of supplications. Interesting. It is so important, therefore, that you not only be saved, but that you be Spirit-filled. If you automatically prayed in the Spirit when you were saved, then the Bible would not command us to pray in the Spirit. Right? So when the Bible commands us to pray in the Spirit, of course, we have to admit the possibility that we could be a Christian and yet not be praying in the Spirit. But you, dear friends, build yourself up in the most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. So the Bible tells us to pray in the Holy Spirit. Why is it so important to pray in the Spirit? That is, to be yielded to the Holy Spirit. Paul makes it clear, Romans 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weakness. Anybody here weak? Anybody here have an infirmity? Well, hallelujah, you have a helper. The Spirit helps our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. This verse is very interesting to me because the word help has two prefixes, prefixes in it in the original language. And it means instead of and together with, those two prefixes, instead of and together with, are before the word help in this verse that says the Spirit helps our infirmities. Now it almost sounds contradictory that the Holy Spirit prays not only instead of us, but then at the same time pr prays together with us. And that is happening simultaneously. So what does that mean? Well, it's very beautiful. It means that we cannot do it without him, and it also means that he's not going to do it without us. It is the Holy Spirit that so fills us when we pray, when we're surrendered to him, when we're in the Spirit, that he gets our prayers molded and shaped just as they should be before God. And the effect of that is our prayers are then acceptable to the Father. To help means that he inspires our prayers. He guides our prayers. He energizes our prayers. He sustains our prayers. And without his help, we'd never get it done. And hallelujah for the helper. Not only because of our weaknesses, but also because of our ignorance. Now, not in the bad sense, but listen, we don't know always what we ought to pray for, right? Folks, listen. Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we don't know what we should pray for as we should. And you cannot pray for everything, and I believe that the Holy Spirit of God, His prayer assignments to us, for your prayer to be effective, it also needs to be specific. You cannot pray in general, God bless the world, and you're done praying because you covered everything. But when you get down to specific praying, the Holy Spirit of God will give you a specific assignment. 
And not only does he tell you who to pray for, but he tells you how to pray and for whom you pray. Or if he doesn't tell you, then he'll just make groanings for you, words that you can't utter, but the Spirit of God, as he captures you and takes over what you're saying. For example, my grandmother, the same one, my nana, that used to embarrass the death out of us, was in her 90s, and I'm by now well into my 20s, and she's sick, and I'm starting to pray, and I've been saved by now when I wasn't diving, when I was diving under tables. And I didn't know what to pray. I mean, she was in her 90s. Lord God, heal her, or Lord God, super heal her, and bring her to heaven. I didn't know. And when I kneeled down and I prayed for my Nana, I prayed, God, if you'll tell me what to pray, to, I'll trust you for exactly what you said, and I'll know, and I'll stand up and I'll pray. When I kneeled next to my son at the University of Alabama Research Hospital 13 months ago, and there was a bullet entrance on one side of his head and an exit on the other side of the head, head and he'd been clinically dead for three days, and he's hooked up to all these machines in this, in this big room, and they're keeping every system in his body functioning, waiting for the, for the uh, organ transplant team to, to fly in and harvest all of this. And so uh, we had gone down there at, at uh, 1 o'clock in the morning because they said the uh, organ transplant team was landing that night. And I went in there, and he was warm to the touch, and he was, he was sweating, and everything looked like it was working, but he'd been clinically dead for three days. And I prayed. God, raise him up. But God, not my will, but yours. You know, he didn't get out of that bed. But I take comfort in the fact that he's super healed. And he's in the presence of the Father. And that's kind of hard, isn't it? And I didn't mean to use that or manipulate with it, but the Holy Spirit takes our prayers, and even sometimes when we ask for the wrong things, if we have the right heart, then the Spirit of God takes the right thing and applies it to the right heart. The Spirit of God makes it acceptable. It is made adaptable. It is made usable because of God's influence on you in His Spirit. And many times our prayer power, our energy, because it comes from a heart that is that is right with God, the Holy Spirit says to the Father, now Father, this is what he thinks he needs, but this is what he really needs. So rule number, well, not rule number one, but principle number one, pray in the name. Rule number two, principle number two, pray in the Spirit. And as you pray in the Spirit, find the Spirit marvelous. Find him comforting. Find the beauty and love and what the Spirit is doing for you. And you know when you're there, when you can't help but, but worship Him and thank Him and engage with Him. Oh, you're there because of the relationship and not the payoff. Rule number three, pray in obedience. It is foolish to pray and to ask God to answer your prayer if you're not obeying. David knew better than to try and pray when he was disobeying the Lord. He says in Psalm 66, 18, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord won't hear me. Just think about that for a minute. If I'm cherishing sin in my heart, I've got this stuff that I'm kind of patting on the head and don't want out of my life. Nice sin, nice sin. The Lord will not hear me. The Bible says if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord won't hear me. And then we have the audacity sometimes and, and the nerve to come to God and we say, now God, here's what I want you to do for me and for my precious sin, this thing I'm hanging on to. Now God, here's what I want you to do. And David said, if I regard that, God will not hear me. The Apostle John says in 3.22, 1 John, whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight now i'm not saying when you obey god you earn the answer to your prayers don't hear me say that it is grace all the way but i am saying to you that you cannot harbor an unconfessed unrepented uh, sin in your life and expect to have power with god in prayer as you pray in obedience see god is love loving you individually nehemiah says god is singing over you 
because he loves you so much and as your heart is melted by God's love for you it begins to control you and that love is so consuming and if you the more you take it in and the more the spirit sheds that on the heart onto your heart the more you won't be able to help but be obedient to what he's asking you to do it's not how hard you try not to sin in your life it's how hard you surrender to God's spirit to control what you're doing in your life the fourth thing your prayer must be in the will of God you know we can sometimes think of prayer as our way of getting our will done on earth getting it done in heaven but you see prayer is God's way of getting his will done on earth and in 1 John 5 14 and this is the confidence that we have in him if we ask anything according to his name he will hear us and if we know that he hears whatsoever we ask we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him now we must ask in the will of God well how are we going to know the will of God well in order to know the will of God we must want the will of God and you see to know what God wants me to do I must know I must want to do what God wants me to do now, I may not know God's will but let's say in a certain case you know that I know what God wants done in your life and I and I walk up to you and as God's appointed authority just for this illustration and I say hey, there is something God wants you to do. Will you do it? And a lot of Christians, by how they're kind of leading their life, the answer is kind of, well, tell me what it is. I'd like to hear it first. Do you know that the answer should be, if you know that God wants you to do it, yes, I'll do it. Tell me what it is, and I'll say amen. Isaiah said, here I am, Lord, send me. And, they, and it was nothing but a prediction of rejection that he was going to. But God called him to it. There should be full and instantaneous obedience to the will of God even before the will of God is known. So that when God reveals it, we simply do it. You see, we don't have to worry about his will. His will is best. And not only that, you would want exactly everything God wants if you knew everything God knows, right? We said that. It is good, it is acceptable, and it is perfect. And prayer is not bending God's will to fit our will. It's not talking, in God, talking God into doing something that he ordinarily doesn't want to do. All prayer is, is finding out the will of God and getting in on it. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The reason that many people pray and their prayers are not answered is we're not praying the will of God. But James chapter 4, verse 3 says, you ask and receive not because you have the wrong stuff that you might consume it upon your own lust the word emits means that you're asking with the wrong intent now that doesn't mean that you cannot ask for personal needs God's honor is fulfilled when your personal needs are met but God is not the Fifth Avenue Mall okay So many people have misunderstood the Bible when the Bible says, delight yourself also in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Man, I've tried to leverage that one a few times. Let me ask you a critical question here. Does that mean you can have anything you want? Well, yes and no. Look at it carefully. Now, there's no fine print, but isn't this promise, his promise, isn't it made to the person who delights himself in the Lord. And let me tell you, your delights determine your desires, right? True? And so therefore God makes his promise. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And you find, now here it is, you find yourself not trying to talk God into doing things that he would ordinarily not do. But you do find yourself receiving those blessings that God has foreordained for you and planned for you to have, and you quickly learn that those blessings are exceedingly abundantly beyond anything you could have asked for or were asking for in the first place, and you're ten times better off with what he decided to do instead of what you were asking him to do. So you must pray in the will of God. That's the fourth thing. Number one, Pray in the name of Jesus. Number two, pray in the Spirit. Number three, pray in obedience. Number four, pray in the will of God. 
And as you seek to express obedience to God, first see Jesus. By the way, this is where the power comes from to do it or begins to look at that. First see Jesus as so obedient to God, he ignored those who mocked him in Luke chapter 21. He said, oh, if that's truly the Son of God, let him save us and save himself. But he was obedient to God. And he got all the way out on our behalf, and he wouldn't save himself so he could save us. And when you see Jesus doing that, you begin to see how beautiful he is in that act, or how beautiful he is over here doing this, or how beautiful he is in another account creating that. And you have his presence. And you have Jesus who could save you because he wouldn't save himself out of obedience, out of love. And if you'll see that, you'll have the power you need for your personal obedience. If you'll see his beauty, if you'll be driven by that, because it will come from seeing the beauty of the one who is ultimately obedient for, to his Father to save you and to glorify God. And then, you also have to pray in fellowship, and I'm almost done. If you look in Mark eleven twenty five, 25, here's what the Lord says about prayer. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Now there is a truth here that tells you that if you're out of fellowship with someone else, you're to some degree out of fellowship with the Father. That's pretty serious. Isn't it? That's pretty strong. If I have an offense, a root of bitterness in my heart towards my brother, that affects my relationship to my heavenly Father? Because you have to pray in fellowship. Many people are harboring grudges. So many people have bitterness in their heart. So many people have an unforgiving spirit and they wonder why their life is barren and why their prayers are unfruitful. And they're arguing and husbands and wives and you're not in harmony. You're not in oneness. You're not in fellowship. 1 Peter 3, 7, Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as co-heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. That's what it says. And if lives are filled with bitterness and rancor and arguing and all those things, the prayers are hindered. We must pray in fellowship. We must be in harmony with our brothers and sisters in Christ. How important is it that we be in harmony with one another? As you're seeking to be in harmony with everyone, as as, you, as you're thinking about this, where does the power come from to forgive what that person or that relative or that whoever it is? How can I possibly accomplish this, this fellowship thing, Weaver? Well, there's a whole sermon on this, but it basically boils down to this. If you'll put the little story of how that other person did you wrong into the big story of how Jesus was done wrong. You'll have all the power you need. And I mean, people are done wrong in, in some unfathomable ways. And they're serious. And there's only one place that can make this terrible, ugly story shrink down under the power of the cross. And that's to take that as serious and hurtful it is, as it is and put it into the story of how Jesus was done wrong. And you'll find the power. You'll find the power to forgive and to release that person who did that thing. You'll have all the power you need. And let me say parenthetically, if you don't, eventually, not only will you become the evil that was done to you, you'll become more than the evil that was done to you. The last thing I want to say very quickly, pray in faith. And praying in faith is the sum total of all of these other things. And when you're in obedience to His will in the Spirit and these other things are in place, then you see faith is going to be there. 
because according to your faith, be it unto you. I don't know what you'll accomplish in life, what your friends, your fame, your fortune, your whatever it is, but I do know how it's going to be measured according to your faith, be it unto you. When you're in obedience to his will in the spirit and these other things are in place, you see faith is going to be there. All and all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, Jesus speaking in Matthew 21, believing you shall receive. Pray, believe, and you'll receive. Pray and doubt, you do without. Hebrews eleven six. 6, but without faith it's impossible to please God. And no prayer has ever been answered that was not a prayer of faith. No prayer of faith has ever been unanswered. So there's no sense in praying without confidence. And Jesus will give you that confidence. And it'll be everything you need. Because we're coming together just this Friday. And we're going to pray individually. And we're going to pray corporately. And we're going to pray in Jesus' name. And we're going to pray in Jesus' will. And we're going to pray in the Holy Spirit. And we're going to pray in obedience to Jesus. And we're going to pray in fellowship with one another. And we're going to pray in faith. This isn't like, good grief, I'm a member of this church, and it's like nine hours total. We really, I understand that we really need to do this. That is an approach of defeat. I'm a member of this church. Well, I'm not, but you are. And we're going to come together as the body of Christ. And we're going to swim on more promises in Scripture that are brought to pass by the Holy Spirit than that guy could tell in five hours. And God in His sovereignty is going to come down on that place as His Word promises. And He's going to work and He's going to do miracles and He's going to provide freedom as His Word promises. And I'm going to experience fullness of joy because I'll be in His presence as His Word promises. It's unthinkable unless we're providentially hindered or already got that ticket to Waikiki that we're not there. Because God called your pastor to call this time. And God called you and me to come and see the miracle magnificence of God in action. Not because of what He'll do for us, but because of how beautiful He is. Stand with me together if you would. Pastor, do you want to have an invitation? Okay. In just a minute, I'm going to have a prayer of invitation. And if you'll just be willing, come down and take a stand or a knee or whatever it is. Say, God, I'm still on the fence about this or whatever it is. But God, I'm willing to hear from you and to do what you're calling and to see my life and the lives of my brothers and sisters transformed by your presence. It doesn't reflect something's wrong. It reflects that Jesus is always taking us to the next step in who he is in transformation. I'm praying. Mitch is playing. You're coming. And we'll believe God together for a miracle. And as the prayer team is down here and, and your folks are, uh, you have other needs, you want to receive Jesus as your Savior this morning, you come in Jesus' name. He'll do whatever it is, the spiritual business that you have to accomplish with Him. Father, we love you this morning, Lord. We thank you that you are high and lifted up. We thank you that from you and through you and to you are all things including us. And God, find us faithful. Find us on our knees. Find us finding you beautiful. Because you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are God, high and lifted up. For your root fills the temple. Holy Spirit, do your work. Take your liberty. In Jesus' name, and to the glory of God, we commit it all. Amen.